The scripture reading for session two is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 4 to verse 25. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time, he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is the word of the Lord. I now pass the time to our camp speaker, Reverend Jayaraj, for tonight's message, The Great Transformation. Thank you very much, uh, Li Fang. Good evening to all of you all. Greetings. God bless you all as you uh, listen to God's word. I believe that God will surely minister to every one of you. And uh, um, I I'm sure that uh, in some way you'd be touched by the uh, power and presence of God. Shall we, look to the word? Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for this time, Lord. And as we draw near to you, Lord, we want to thank you, Father God, that you are always with us. You are already there for us, Master. And even as your word says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. So, Father God, we know and we have the assurance that your presence is with us, and you would continuously, Lord, lead us and show us your ways. Even now, as we look at your word, we pray, Father, for revelation, revelation from above, Master, revelation through your spirit, so that, Lord, in every way, we'd be transformed. We'd be transformed by your word and by your power. 
we thank you, Father God, for this time. And we know, Father God, that you minister to us your word. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. And um, yeah, yesterday we saw about a new season that God would take us to uh, when we actually sort of uh, are determined to do what God wants us to do. Then God shifts everything and makes it possible for us to move in the direction that he has for us. And that he did to Nehemiah during the time of Nehemiah for the people of, uh, of, of Israel. And so we, uh, we see that uh, indeed uh, it was actually God's work uh, in them and through them that made great things possible for them. Today we are just going to focus upon a great transformation, a great transformation that can happen if we actually commit ourselves and when we desire after God and we go after him, then this transformation is actually needful, very needful for our own personal lives to be renewed in Christ and also for our church to be renewed and restored in Christ. And this, this is two, there are two things actually that I'd like to touch on, personal, personal renew, renewal and also in terms of corporate renewal. And the first part, we didn't get it read actually, uh, because that's another long passage. It's taken from John chapter four, verses one onwards. It's a long passage telling about the story of the Samaritan woman. So um, if we are going to go through that whole passage, it will take time. But I thought I'll just actually sort of uh, touch on that first, and then we will come move on to the second part where, uh, where the scripture portion was read to us from Acts chapter eight. Um, if you see that uh, in this uh, Samaritan woman's uh, story, which all of us know, I believe that all of us are very familiar with this Samaritan woman whom Jesus had come to visit. It was actually a divine visitation uh, and it transformed her, it changed her identity totally. And that's what God does to us when he actually visits us and when we have an encounter with him. I'm sure all of us have gone through that process of actually meeting up with God or more God meeting up with us. And when that happens, something within us changes, something around us changes, something about us changes so that in every way we are totally new, we are totally different. And we are moving on with Christ in that journey of life where God is continuously actually changing us, molding us, shaping us, renewing us. And, and that's very important for us in our own lives. And how does it happen? Actually, if you see in this story, Jesus visits the Samaritan village called Shika in John chapter four, verses one to 45, you would see this whole story. And as he visits this uh, village, actually they were going through the Samaritan village. And as they were passing by, Jesus was thirsty and he goes to the well. And then at the well, as he actually looks forward to someone who would come and give him water for his, to quench his thirst, this Samaritan lady appears, this woman appears. Samaritans are generally actually abhorred or hated by the Jews. The Jews and the Samaritans have a very major rift. Actually, historically, they had been divided into the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And so the Northern Kingdom was Samaria and the Southern Kingdom was Judah. This is all Old Testament history. Yeah? And I'm sure you would know about that. So these Samaritans actually what happened was that they'd always been unfaithful to God. All through their history, you would see that every other king was actually, had, had actually drifted away from God. And they let, they let Israel away to move away from God. And, and, and that was actually a curse on them. And so eventually we see that the Assyrians come and they capture them. And as they capture them and they take them uh, to Assyria, there were a lot of Assyrians still there in, in Samaria itself. They were actually in the Northern Kingdom. And when they went over to Assyria, they were involved in mixed marriage and loose life. Their morals had slided down. And when they came, back after the exile, they came back as a people who were very much polluted 
very much corrupt, very defiled, and all of their moral values went haywire. They were not actually, actually faithful Jews. They were actually a mixed community. And likewise, those people who stayed back, who did not actually go into exile, they too married the Assyrians. And so it was a very mixed culture with a lot of uh, belief system that was polluted by so many external forces. And that is one, one reason why the Jews completely de detested them. They were like an abomination to them. They completely pushed them aside and they would never ever want to go by way of Samaria from Galilee to Judea or Judea to Judea to Galilee. They would always bypass Samaria. But here Jesus chooses to go through uh, Samaria and here he comes to this village called Shika and he meets this Samaritan woman. And this Samaritan woman, actually uh, you, you will see in this story that Jesus has a purpose and it's with a purpose that he comes and meets up with her in a very personal and intimate converse, conversation with her. He, he actually sort of meets all of her needs and there is a tremendous change in her life. And uh, actually, if you would see the Samaritan lady's profile, which Jesus knew by word of knowledge, he knew what this Samaritan lady actually, her, her profile. Yesterday when, the, when Pastor Robert was introducing me, he gave a profile about me. He gave the present profile of probably uh, a recent, uh, recently how I was and how, uh, what are the ministries I was involved and so on. And all of it was positive. Uh, none of it was negative. Surely he would, he, he dare not speak anything negative about me. <laughs> uh, but um, but uh, uh, this is something recent. But if you look at my past, long time ago, even before when I accepted the Lord and accept, even after accepting the Lord, my past was also a horrible past. I had so many things not going good for me. In many ways, I drifted away from God. In many ways, I had stumbled fallen and and in so many ways there were so many weaknesses so many limitations in me and i had to actually sort of wage a good warfare a spiritual warfare to actually sort of push myself and 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 sort of connect with god and be one with god and that's an old story but when you look at the profile of the samaritan woman she was actually if you go through her profile she was a condemned person a rejected person a person full of bondage probably a lot of burdens she was carrying there was no hope at all for her in her life she was a helpless person or hopeless person basically because the immoral lifestyle that she lived she had lived with four husbands and the present husband that she was living with was actually not her husband and so such a sinful life she was living. And in, in every way, uh, nobody would ever go near her. But Jesus goes near her. Jesus goes near her and begins to talk to her. And that actually surprised her, caught her by surprise, because the first question that she asked was that when Jesus asked her for a cup of water, was that, how is it that you being a Jew, you are talking to me, a Samaritan, we Jews and you, we, we Samaritans and you Jew have so much of a difference. And how is it that you can come even closer to me and talk to me? But that's what Jesus does, isn't it? He has no distinction. He's no respecter of people. He actually, even the worst criminal and the worst sinner, he's, 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 he's in every way worthy in his sight, worthy to become a child in the kingdom of God. So we see that uh, this in, in a conversation, this lady uh, talks about, he, she talks with great pride. She talks, about, she talks about Jerusalem. She talks about the mountain where they are worshiping. She talks about the temple. She talks about the Messiah whom they are waiting for. She talks about worship. And all these, these things are spiritual things. All these things are spiritual things. It's, in fact, it was like a spiritual camouflage Deep within, she was a very, very sinful person, but externally, outwardly, she was actually covering up with many of these things. Many times in our own spiritual life, we tend to 
cover our faith life, our spiritual life with a lot of religion, a religious, religious garbage, you can call. We, we actually cover it up with a lot of things that we actually um, may not be actually that we can cover it up with our position, our finances, our achievements, uh, our, 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 our wealth and uh, our stature, many things we can actually sort of uh, cover it up and think or assume and give the impression to people that I'm all okay, everything is okay with me. But deep within, there can be a lot of struggles that we may be going through, just like the Samaritan woman, just like this woman who had not had an encounter with God. But an encounter with God, a visitation by God, completely changes everything. It actually, uh, actually sort of a, um, brings about a tremendous change in a life. And that is what God does for any one of us. I remember a young man in Taiping when I was working there, when I was ministering there at the Taiping Church way back in the 1980s, late 1980s. Uh, there was this small town near Taiping. It was an outreach area. And weekly we used to go there. It's a place called Trung. And uh, so we, we, were, we were actually doing a prayer meeting, regular prayer meeting in a house, in a house, and a few families used to get together. And in, in this prayer meeting, there was a young uh, Hindu girl, a non-Christian, she used to attend the prayer meeting. And somehow or other, she was very much attracted to the teachings of Jesus. And she committed her life to Jesus. But her fiancé, the person whom she was going to get married, was actually a, a traditional Christian who had not known Christ, who was not worshipping, who was not going to church at all, but he was actually a, a, a wanted criminal. He was actually one of the uh, gang leaders in the city of one, uh, uh, typing area, and also the, uh, uh, the, the whole range, uh, that, that eastern part, that, that coastal area uh, of, of, of that part. Uh, Kuala Slango and so on. So he was actually a gang leader. He was a drug addict. He was also a womanizer. He was selling, trading flesh and, and, and so many, so many things, so many baggages he had. And with all of that, with all of that, there was a real struggle for this young girl. Should I get married to him? How, how is it that he is going to respond? I am now so very much interested in becoming a Christian, but my uh, fiancé would never ever agree. But I told her, why don't you pray about it? Why don't you pray to God for him? And then perhaps one of the days when he comes by, you just visit him to come to this meeting and I will also pray for him. So what she did was that she started praying and one of the days, because most of the time he's always traveling, he's never ever in throne or in typing. He's always on his uh, tour for, for, for his actually sort of uh, this, this sinful business that he was involved in. So one of the days he came to the meeting and then he liked it. Somehow or other he liked it. And then again, he came again. The next visit he came and the next visit he came. Within about two to three months, there was a total change. He committed his total life to the Lord. And he said that no more of this past I don't want this past life. And that was an amazing testimony. And, and, and he committed his life and he said that I, I, I want to live for the Lord. And through him, actually, uh, because of him, the, 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 the marriage was, uh, the marriage took place in, in the typing church, but he was still a wanted person. He was wanted by police. He was wanted by his former gang people. And he was always on the hideout. Uh, but but God had already done a great work, a deep work within. And in every way, he was actually a renewed person, a restored person. It is just something like this Samaritan woman uh, with so much, so much of um, uh, her, her profile was horrible. But Jesus is actually willing to change anyone, renew anyone who would desire and thirst after him. And the, and the water that he gives is far superior to what the women, woman could give to him. The woman could get, just give 
a water, a glass of water to quench his thirst. But Jesus gave her a water, the living water that could continuously transform her total life and take her into a new future. I believe that all of us have gone through this experience of having an encounter with God where God comes becomes so real to us, so close and so personal to us, so much so that nothing else in this world matters. Nothing else in this world counts. And only when we are actually renewed in our personal lives, then we are ready to be bring about transformation in our family and also in our church and also in our society. And that's what happens to this lady. What happens was that she begins to experience this fullness of joy and peace and love. And now her profile immediately changes, complete change in a profile. Earlier, she was full of bondage. She was full of uh, and full of hopelessness. But now with this new profile, she was ready to face the world and face anyone. She was actually, she received salvation. She, from bondage, she came, from bondage, she came, she came to freedom, from sorrow to joy, from burden to rest, from despair to hope. Everything about her, within her and outside of her changed. And the water that Jesus, Jesus gives continues to well up within us as a living water. And that continuously actually not only changes and transforms us, continuously renews and restores us. It brings about changes and transformation to everyone whom we come into contact. And that's how God works in our own lives. Uh, Kenneth, can you put the first picture, the first one, the first slide? Yeah, I think I should have told him to do it earlier. I forgot. No, the other one, the other one. The Samaritan woman, yes, yeah. This is probably the conversation eh, that Jesus was having with the Samaritan woman uh, uh, around the well. Um, but but I think uh, what she wanted was that that she had to continuously uh, prime the pump. She had to put her uh, jar down the well and lift it up and give it to Jesus. But the way Jesus works is that it is no more you working for me. It is no more you giving to me. I can give to, give to you uh, free of charge. And there's no work at all, in work involved at all. And you can have it. And that leads you to eternity, newness and freshness in every way. If you, if, if those of you are older, the previous generation, you would know like Pastor and myself and all, those days, back, way back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, there was this camera, the manual camera, where you have to sort of a put in a, a film and then take a, a, a shot, a, a photograph. And then the negative, actually, the, the, you have to give it to the Photoshop, the man, and then he would actually sort of a develop it into a beautiful picture. And, and that was the way it was. If, let's say, we are going to take a shot with that camera and the negative is given to, her, to us, the negative actually would be so ugly. It will not actually reflect our true image at all. It is all dark and, and black and, 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 and nothing. Uh, we would never ever appreciate that image in that, uh, in that film. But uh, when the picture is developed, fully developed, then it becomes a beautiful picture. All of us, uh, all of you are beautiful people, men and women, children and young people. All of y'all uh, actually, uh, actually can have that image. And that image actually reflects the image of Jesus himself. Renewal is basically actually becoming like Christ. We actually put on the image of Jesus and he does that through his spirit. The water welling up within us is the spirit that he gives to each one of us. And I believe that all of you, all of you in the church are a people who have the spirit being, who have the spirit living in you, residing in you, continuously at work within you and continuously conforming you to the image of Christ. And that is why God has chosen us. That is why God has called us. 
and it is it is in every way to give us, give to us this new identity a new person that god has come for us and this life is in every way a, a fantastic life a life of fullness a life of joy a life of peace a life of uh, a life of a life of continuous uh, 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 love and and hope that god instills within us perhaps i can ask you this question are you in your own life going through roots of pain anguish frustration boredom limitations so many weaknesses you're trying and trying and trying struggling and struggling and struggling and again and again you seem to be stumbling you seem to be falling back but you want to move ahead in life you want to go on with jesus but somehow or other you're always walking on slippery grounds and it becomes it's it, it has become very difficult but you don't have to worry at all about that because that's one stage in a christian life but i believe that has you commit yourself to the lord and as you ask for god's infilling of his spirit his spirit is the one that is at work in us philippians chapter 2 verse 13 paul says that god is at work to will and to do according to his good pleasure it is his work in our lives we don't have to struggle we don't have to toil we don't have to push ourselves in our christian lives we allow that living water to flow into our lives we allow his spirit to begin to work in our lives and when we are thirsting after him and desiring after him and asking him to fill us then everything changes everything becomes different in my own life when i was young i actually accepted the lord when i was about 16 17 years old and uh, at the age of 20 i went over to india to 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 do my theological studies and over there there was a period when i was going through so much of dryness it was actually uh, sort of a, a really sort of a taking its toll on me i i was struggling and struggling and struggling and there were many other of my friends who had come from different parts of the world and they were experiencing so much of joy and peace and i was questioning why is it that i am struggling so much when all of my friends are actually sort of having this experience of joy and peace and assurance and comfort in their lives and and when i when i asked them they were all saying the same thing it is all by the power of the spirit it's the spirit who must come actually and actually must be must must dwell within, within us and he must be allowed to operate within us to change us and to transform us and so i began to thirst after this living water though i was converted i was a born again christian yet my knowledge about god and my understanding of the faith was so little and 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 even during the college time in the first couple of years i was actually struggling through but it's only at one time when i fully surrendered myself fully yielded myself to the lord lord you have your way it is your work it is your power it is your mission lord it is your your will that you want to do in my life you have it your way and as i yielded myself completely then the transformation took place when god's spirit visibly invisibly was evident in my life and i could say i could say with 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 firmness with all confidence that god is in me it is basically abiding in christ in john 15 jesus talks about abiding in christ when we begin to abide in christ to be rested in christ then renewal becomes so easy and growth and growing going on with christ and moving up the scale becomes so very much easy and i believe that all of us uh, uh, go through that phase and i believe that all of us all of you would would experience this richness and this power that comes through his presence and his spirit john wesley himself you would know i'm sure you would have heard messages about john wesley in his own life when he was going through a period of dryness he went over to america 
thinking that he could be a good missionary, but then he failed. He turned back as a very disappointed, disillusioned young man. And as he came back to UK, he met, he met a, this group of people, the Moravians, and these Moravians were worshiping God, praising God uh, from the depths of their heart. And what is it that they have that I don't have? What is it that they don't have? That uh, what is it that they have and I don't have? That became a very big debate deep within his heart. And out of this longing, out of this thirst, out of this desire to know, to have more of God, to have everything of God, that was actually a starting point in John Wesley's life. And Aldersgate experience where his heart was strangely warmed in a prayer meeting with the Moravians. And in that, after that experience, after that experience of being completely surrendered to God, yielded to God and being filled in the spirit, then his life was renewed and he was actually very fervent, very fervent and, and zealous for the things of the Lord. And after that, you, you would know yeah, in history says that it was, that was the beginning of ministry for John Wesley. For after that, the revival, revival began, the revival wave began to take over and there were so many changes all over UK because of his mission and ministry. And uh, I believe that these are days when God is doing just that. He is actually visiting his people. He is visiting churches. He is visiting many, many areas which where people have not come to know the Lord. And we who know the Lord, we who have been renewed can become an instrument in the hands of God to bring about this good news, to bring about this joy even to others, just like the Samaritan lady, just like that spontaneously, she went out to her village, leaving her pot. And then she goes to the village and comes back bringing a throng of people. A lot of them come back to meet up with Jesus, knowing that he is truly the Messiah. I believe that Jesus gives a completely new profile. Not only that, he changes us completely and gives us a new identity. And that's what happens to each one of us. Our identity is in Christ. Without him, we are nothing. But with him, we can firmly and strongly say that I can face tomorrow I can face anything. I am being empowered by him. I live for him and I serve him alone. I can do everything because of him. And so with, with, with that, we move on to the second part, the part that was read to us just now by Li Fang. And uh, this is going back to chapter eight, chapter eight of Acts. And, and in this passage, we see that Philip, was actually the like the Philip the Apostle was the first missionary to the to, to the whole country of Samaria. Uh, Samaritans were actually a rejected good group of people. Perhaps nobody would want to go there, but Philip was led by God to go there. And when he begins to share with them, many of them, many of them received healing, demons were cast out, signs and wonders were done, and there was already a group of people actually thronging to hear Philip and they all actually accepted the Lord at that time. And it was a marvelous change, a marvelous renewal transformation that was taking place in this nation. I believe that God had a purpose for Samaria because the Samar Samaritans were actually Jews. Originally they were Jews and now they are a mixed breed actually. They have, they have, they have a mixed culture a mixed race, but Jesus still loved them. And that is why in the Gospels you see that Jesus talks about in Luke 17, 12 to 19, about the 10 lepers, the 10 lepers who were healed, the one man who came back, he was a Samaritan. And Jesus actually mentions about that and says that he was a Samaritan. And then in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, Jesus talks about the good Samaritan there was the priest, there was the Levite who would not help a, a person in need, a neighbor in need. But when he tells about this story, he talks about the Samaritan. Jesus has already actually, actually was connecting with the, was relating 
to the disciples that Samaritans are in his agenda. Samaritans are important people. And so that is why he makes mentions, probably he makes mentions mention over there. But a more convincing verse is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where he says that you shall preach the gospel in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria. He includes Samaria. And then he says that, and even to the ends of the world. So Samaria was in God's agenda. The Samaritan woman was in God's agenda. And we see all this being connected. And that is why Philip goes there. One of the uh, first moves that he makes is that he goes to Samaria and he makes a major impact. And what happens after that is that you move on to the second part of this chapter in chapter eight, we see that the, uh, the, 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 the church at Antioch sent Peter and John to Samaria because Samaria had, Samaria had received the gospel. And that was great news for them because for the first time, a rejected community, a community was not wanted or paid heed by anyone. No one would acknowledge them. No one, everyone would ignore them. But then Jesus had a purpose for them. And he brings about a tremendous change. And when Peter and John come and minister to them, what happens is that for the first time, for the first time, the spirit comes and fills them. They all get, get baptized in the spirit and they all begin to speak in tongues. And that manifestation of the spirit was so remarkable, so profound and so amazing it was. And it must it, it is definitely uh, an amazing work of God. God, Jesus in the Gospels visited Samaria. But over here, we see that Jesus, through his spirit, he comes and he has a habitation with the people. That means God comes to habitate his people. He comes to dwell amongst his people. So both these must be always in our lives. We must have continuous visitation of God, encounter with God, and we must also have the habitation of God. And the habitation would mean that the spirit coming upon us and resting upon us. When Jesus was baptized in John 1.32, we would see that the spirit descended upon him like a dove and rested on him. And likewise, in Acts chapter 2, verse 3, you would see that the spirit descended upon all those disciples and apostles like a cloven tongue of fire, the spirit rested on them. And over here too, in Acts of the Apostles, wherever the disciples or the apostles went, wherever they ministered, wherever they ministered, there was always a resting, an abiding, a habitation of God's presence in everyone's life. And this is what we need actually for transformation, for transformation to take place and for renewal to take place in our lives and in the mission and ministry that God has given to us. We must always be always filled in the spirit and we must experience the sweetness and richness of the spirit. Then we are actually a people who are renewed and prepared to do and carry out what God has for each one of us. So there is a major shift here, a shift where God makes the gospel available to the Gentiles. And it's through the Samarian church it came about. This was the first, this was the first group of people where the gospel went out of Jerusalem. And Samaria, that means, is actually the Samaritans, though rejected by the world, by the Jews, yet was a group of people, was a group of people or a, was a community of people or was a nation that was so dear and so close to Jesus. Likewise, I believe that all of us need to have that sense, that feeling that we are in every way dear to God. We are close to God. And that is why God has continuously been working in our lives. God has continuously been, been moving in our lives, bringing about changes, bringing, bringing about transformation. Over in our land too, we see there are so many changes that are taking place. Perhaps we may not see it so obviously, but then 
there are pockets of people being touched and ministered, touched and ministered and transformed, though it may not be easy. Evangelism, gospel, more so in this pandemic season, may not be easy, may be quite difficult, but yet we hear of people, we hear of testimonies of people being touched and impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what God would do to, through, to, to, to us and to each one of us. And uh, if we see further in this portion in, in Acts chapter 8, we also see that there was one man who was actually a magician, Simon the magician. He also accepted the Lord and he also wanted to follow the Lord. But when he saw Paul and Peter, Peter and John, uh, Peter and John laying their hands on, on, on the Samaritans, he was excited. Wow, by laying on of hands, I can also sort of uh, have the spirit and impart the spirit. That would be tremendous. I'm not very sure what he thought was, but probably he had a selfish agenda. I want self-promotion. I want my agenda to be fulfilled. Immediately, Peter turns around to him because he says, he asks that whether he could buy this anointing. And, 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 and Peter was sensitive to the spirits leading. And immediately, he sort of reprimands him and says that you are full of evil. You do not have anything to do with what God is doing in this place. And so uh, that, that, that was a sharp reprimand over there. I believe that when God moves and God's spirit moves in us and through us and in our church, then renewal takes place. And when renewal is taking place, there's no place for self or selfish agenda or worldliness or any kind of pride in our lives. And God removes that. God removed Ananias and Sapphira way back in Acts chapter uh, 4, I guess. And, 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 and we know that every time there is, there is something carnal or earthly or worldly coming in to the church, Jesus, God actually deals with it. And I believe that even in this place, in this place uh, for renewal to be holistic and to be complete, we must always guard ourselves from all kinds of worldly pride, selfishness, and, 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 and self-glory. And we must always be prepared to give God the glory. And the final part, if we come to the final part, we see that what happens is that the, the, the wind of God blows all across Samaria. It, is, it started with just a very, very sinful woman, and then it moved on to a small group of people, and then to a community, and then now you would see that the Samaritans actually began to spread the gospel to all the villages around, the towns around, and, 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 and the gospel began to actually sort of transform that whole society. Renewal is like that, and we need renewal if we are actually sort of a, do, going to do God's work effectively, then God's power, God's wave, the wind of the spirit, the wave of the spirit was, must blow within us and in our church so that through a renewed church, God would bring about renewal in the community. And I'm sure that this is God's plan. This is God's purpose. And this is God's agenda. And when we are actually sort of a deeply committed to him, surrendered to him, and, and yielded to him, and, and when we desire after God, just like the Samaritan woman, and when we are open to the Lord, just like the Samaritan people in Acts chapter 8, and, and just like them, when we are completely willing to yield to God in everything and be empowered by his presence, then God would do great things, marvelous things, wonderful things in and through us. Uh, then there was this man called William Mullock, William Mullock, in, way back in 1742. 1742, it's a long, long time ago. Eh? And this was during the time of revival, uh, during John Wesley and George Whitfield and Charles Wesley and Jonathan Edwards and many of the revivalists 
of those years. William Mullock actually was actually ministering as a pastor in Kambul Sun in Scotland. Kambul Sun in Scotland, probably a small remote town. Eh? And in this town, as he was working, he was getting exhausted, getting tired, because day in and out, it was the same kind of a thing. And, and finally, he wanted to give up. He wanted to give up the ministry. And one night, he cried out to his people and said that, we must actually, we must actually be restored. We must be renewed. We must be completely yielded to God and surrendered to God. Otherwise, it's no more, it's no use functioning as a church. We might as well close down. And that was the way he cried out to the people and he was actually weeping before them. And what happened was that all the people began to weep. Uh, it was so unexpected, very much unexpected, but actually God's spirit began to move in that place. God began to move. God began to do a good thing. He brought about a tremendous conviction in William's life and also in the life, in, in, in William's life and also in the life of all the people around him. And, 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 and very soon what happened was that they began to pray and seek the Lord. They began to pray and seek the Lord every day. Every day, a small group of people began to meet and pray and pray and they fasted and prayed. And this group began to grow and grow and grow. And how it grew and what happened, it's actually a long story. But then this is how God works. When God's spirit of renewal moves, then everything is so swift. It is just like a revival coming into town. And everyone, everyone gets converted. Many, many, many people actually sort of uh, give, give their lives to God because the spirit takes over. In renewal, the spirit takes over. In renewal, the spirit took over the Samaritan lady. In renewal, the spirit took over the Samaritan church. That is why they became so effective in carrying out the gospel. And, 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 and very soon, this church in Kambul Sang multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And within a, a short period of time, within six months, it had grown up to about 10,000 people gathering for worship. And George Whitfield, you know, he was actually sort of working alongside and probably sometimes most of the time was doing it on his own. He was like an evangelist. He was going all around America and UK. And he was, he used to be invited for the communion services. And for communion services, there used to be about 20,000 people attending the communion service. Of course, the church was not enough. It must, be, must have been in an open ground or open field. And they would gather in such a mighty crowd, always desiring and thirsting after God. And this is the season that we need to actually pray for. We need to pray that God would actually bring about a renewal, a revival in our midst where communities would be impacted with the gospel, where the thirst of God would fall upon one individual, one individual, William Mullock, one individual, the Samaritan woman, and through one person, God can actually move into families, into churches, and many, many people can be touched and impacted and transformed by the gospel. This is gospel power. Renewal is all about gospel power, not our will, not our programs, not our work, not our efforts. It is all about God doing his mission, his work. It's acts of the Holy Spirit. It's not acts of the apostles. It's God at work powerfully through the apostles. And this is the time that we need to cry out to God. And we are all actually in the pandemic season. It's a very dull, dry season for all of us. And it, it's actually sort of a mix. Many people become very complacent, whether we are Christians or not. Everyone goes through this dry spell, actually, in their own lives. More so in our churches, when we are not able to meet, we are not able to encourage one another personally and sort of uh, motivate one another and, and stimulate one another in the faith. And during, even during this, this period, as we go through this uh, time 
of difficulty, of crisis, and then the political situation is there. And I don't know about your political inclinations. I don't talk much about politics. But then even in our own land, we know that politics-wise, there's so much of instability and, and what we are looking forward to may not be actually um, what we would have actually thought of happening in our land. And, and, and with the new prime minister coming in, we have a lot of anxieties. We may have a lot of questions, doubts, whatever it may be, the political situation or the pandemic situation or many other forces at work may all actually be deterrent factors. They may be, may be negative factors, but God is always positive. We must always know that God is always positive and God can work in any situation. He does not need a nice situation, a, 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 a prepared situation. He's just looking for people who would thirst after him. He's looking for people who would be open to him. He's looking for people who would continuously yield themselves, surrender themselves to the Lord so that he can take them up and then we can be vessels in his hands for noble use. And I believe that Subang Madhuri's church, you are a people who are actually so talented and so uh, in many ways, you have the potential to, to scale to new heights. God can do great things in you and through you. You can soar to great heights because God is with you. God has already started great things in you. He's working in you. And what is actually the, what is going to be in the future is in every way something so very much glamorous and glittering because you can be a people who can always desire after God, a people who thirst after God and would be open to God and give in to God so that he can have his way through his spirit. God bless you all and God, God grant you that renewal and revival that's so very much needed. We don't have to wait for a situation when everything would be okay. The pandemic season must clear up and then the political situ situation must be more stable and, and everything must change according to what we want or we like. No, need not be that at all. Need not be that at all. We can actually start it now. What about the, the, the day of salvation? The day of God's visitation, the day of God's favor is today. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, you will see that this is the day of God's favor. This is the day of God's visitation. And as we give ourselves to him, God would begin to do a powerful work. And if he can do an, a great work in the ordinary life of a simple, poor woman, sinful woman, like the Samaritan woman, who was actually rejected and condemned. What more, uh, about us? We have every potential to, to actually be of great use in the hands of God. God bless each one of you. He loves you dearly. You are precious in his sight. He gives you a new identity, an identity that is so very much splendid and, and so profound and so marvelous. And he gives you a transformation deep within, from within, and from without, so that you can always be a river of living water. Uh, uh, Kenneth, the last slide, Kenneth, with that I'll finish. This is, this is the picture of, of living water actually flowing forth. Jesus is promising all of us this, this kind of a water that gushes forth, river of life that flows from within to others, to outside so that many, many people's thirst, spiritual thirst can be quenched and needs can be met and individuals can be renewed and restored. Churches can be renewed and restored. Communities can be renewed and restored. God has this plan and purpose for us. And it's a longstanding eternal plan where we journey on with God and we can always live for God and shine for him. God bless you all. Shall we pray? Father, right now I want to pray for the for all of my brothers and sisters, Lord, everyone who is gathered here, 
that you would continue to minister to them. You would minister much grace to each one of them. You love them so much, Lord. Just as you showed your love to this Samaritan woman and to the Samaritans who were a reject community, Lord, you love us so much, Lord, and you love your people in this church, the pastor in this church. And as they live for you, and as they begin to walk with you, and as they move with you, Master, I pray that a fresh anointing of your power and your presence would be upon them. They would be always yielded vessels, thirsting after you, desiring after you, and Lord, receiving the fullness and the presence of the Spirit, Lord, to, to come and rest upon them. It is not just visitation once a while, Lord, but continuously the Spirit residing in us, God dwelling in us, Emmanuel, you have come to live in us and live with us, Lord. And so through the Spirit alone, we would live for you, love you, and serve you. Bless them all, Master. Bless them all and continue to grant your favor and your mercies in an immeasurable way in, 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 in these days, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.